As we think about factors that impact quail and quail abundance in the state of Texas, certainly weather is a big one, but habitat loss is probably the second biggest one. And when we think about habitat loss, there are various ways that take place, takes place, but one of those is in the form of the types of grasses that have been planted for cattle grazing and then turns out these so-called so improved grasses are not improved for quail. So we want to discuss a little bit about those exotic grasses and what their impact are on quail. Uh, and today we have Amanda Gobley. Amanda is an extension associate with Texas A&M AgriLife working on the Quail Decline Initiative. And Amanda, I'd like to ask you some questions. Um, basically, we had a, we had a uh, viewer call in and say, you know, they call these improved grasses, they're improved for cattle, why don't quail like them? Why aren't they improved for quail? How would you answer that? Um, well, yeah, so I would start out by saying that yes, they are improved for cattle, but what's good for cattle is not always the best for quail. And when we're talking about these exotic grasses, what we're really referring to is a species that has not occurred in this area historically, but that was brought here uh, either intentionally or unintentionally for some purpose. And in the case of most of the exotic grasses in Texas, they were brought here for the purpose of supporting cattle grazing. Um, and really, these grasses have some qualities that make them really, really good for grazing. Like for example, they're able to withstand some really intense grazing pressure, and they're generally able to deal with like heat and drought conditions fairly effectively. But that also makes them really, really good at competing with the native grass species for space. And so the fact that they occur as a monoculture is, is one of the big issues because they crowd everything out, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And that word monoculture is very important because once they've taken over an area and really there's no other you know, native species that are there, you end up with either a single or just a small handful of species in that region. And that's really not very good at all for supporting the kind of diverse habitat and vegetation structure that quail need in their environment to survive. And we know that that plant diversity is important in terms of seed production, in terms of insect availability. So when you lose your species diversity, it, it bites you in several ways, doesn't it? Yep, absolutely. So when you lose that diversity of grasses and of forbs, then not only do you have fewer seed producing plants that are providing food for your quail, but your insect biodiversity, that really important source of protein and calories for your quail, is going to be lost as well. So again, through the cowboy's eyes, through the, the cattle producer's eyes, the fact that these are monocultures and they're producing X number of tons per acre forage, that's all good. But when you look at it through a quail's eye or a quail manager's eye, a lot of these places are just biological deserts, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. I mean, a quail likes to have diversity in its habitat. Um, and that's not incompatible with cattle grazing, but the two species do have some different needs. I know that as we go from one part of the state to the next, there are some really big uh, issues with exotic grasses like in South Texas they they really talk about them down there what are some of the regional grasses that are problematic as we go across the state of Texas. Sure, yeah, and Texas is a big diverse state, so there are going to be definite regional differences in the types of exotic species that you end up running into. Um, in South Texas, they tend to have an awful lot of uh, buffalo grass, for example, as well as like KR blue stem, also the old world blue stems, very prevalent down there. And that's not to be confused with like the big blue stem and the little blue stem, which are native Texas species that are very good for quail. As you head towards central Texas, you start to see a little bit of a difference. Uh, still a lot of KR blue stem in central Texas, but you also start to see uh, Bermuda grass, which is very commonly used in landscaping and on lawns all throughout Texas. And it becomes more prevalent as you move farther east throughout the state. And as you go farther west, you start to see a lot of the invasive love grasses. So you'll see like layman love grass, um, weeping love grass, those kinds of things, as well as more KR blue stem showing up there. Okay, so uh, each species has some problems. They're not always the same. Uh, here in West Texas, at least, we have some exotics, uh, but unless we're talking about a Bermuda grass pasture or maybe a field of weeping love grass in a CRP context, we j typically don't have monocultures. Like here at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch, we have some scattered Caucasian blue stem. Our Klein grass, uh, we have a Klein grass in our uh, CRP fields and so forth. And to me, they haven't been problematic because they're just a component 
of that system, but they don't dominate the system. Exactly, and some of them, like Klein grass, for example, actually do have a structure that quail are able to utilize to a certain extent. They really only become problematic when they, once again, completely take over that area and we lose that diversity. So if they're being kept in check, then you don't have too much to worry about. I've often said that quail aren't plant taxonomists. In other words, they don't know if it's introduced or native or whatever and pointing to some nests that we found here at the Roland Plains Quail Research Ranch. Uh, we had a nest uh, four or five years ago that had 21 eggs in it in Caucasian blue stem. So they're looking for structure. Yes. And, and again, even when I look at, when I go to South Texas and I see buffalo grass, I think, hmm, you know, that, that structure doesn't look all that bad, but it's just the fact that it, it's just a monoculture and there's basically nothing else growing in it. Yep. That's exactly right. If they can nest in it or eat it or at least move through it fairly easily, then a quail can typically find a use for it. But they can't do anything. Let's talk about the, the seeds because typically if we're talking about what you know what do quail eat, uh, there, there aren't a lot of grass seeds that are really good uh, good seed producers for quail. The panicums, the paspalums, some of those are. But why aren't these improved grasses like the old world blue stems and some of those you know, why aren't they good seed producers for quail? That's a really good question. Uh, the fact is, in a quail's eyes, all seeds are not created equal. Typically what they look for in a really good food source in a seed is that it should be kind of hard and slick. So something that's really easy for them to swallow. A lot of these exotic grasses and exotic vegetation produce sort of a fluffy or a hairy seed. And you can imagine that if you tried to swallow something like that, it would get stuck in your mouth and it'd be hard to get it down your throat. And a quail doesn't want to deal with that either. So he's going to try to avoid those kinds of seeds as a food source. And then you also got to think about when, the, when a quail is foraging, the importance of bare ground. Now, I, I don't often make a, much of a case of that here in West Texas because we've got bare ground. But as we get back towards Victoria or further points further east or south with more rain, bare ground can be really, really be an issue. And I, you know, for example, I'm assuming that uh, you know a Bermuda grass, a stand of coastal Bermuda grass this tall probably looks like a bamboo forest to a Bob White. Yeah, you gotta imagine that you're you know a six inch tall bird, you're trying to get through this thick vegetation, and as you're trying to move through it, you also have to be on the lookout for seeds and other sources of food. So if it's so thick you can hardly move, then you're not likely to be able to spot the seeds that you need to eat either. And what impact uh, do you think these exotics have as far as uh, like a monoculture of Bermuda grass, whatever, is on insect availability relative to a more diverse native plant community? Well, again, the more diversity you have in your plant community, the more diversity you're going to have in your insects. And essentially that gives quail more insect biomass and more options. So you could theoretically have a monoculture that does a really good job of supporting grasshoppers. But grasshoppers are not going to be the only insect food source that a quail wants to utilize. They're also going to want to eat beetles and leaf hoppers and, you know, other types of insects. So if you maintain that diversity, then the insects are going to be there. You're not going to have to manage specifically for the insects if you just have the forbs. Well, let's talk about what can we do. I mean, you know, a lot of times we've inherited what we've got kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's probably a wise strategy if you don't have exotics, think long and hard before introducing them in, in terms of replacing native grass. But a lot of countries, you know, you, you bought something, it's got 80 acre Bermuda field on it, or it's got 200 acres of buffalo grass. What are some options that we can do? Yeah, so, you're absolutely right. Like the most important management practice when it comes to exotics is prevention. If you can try to make sure that those exotic species don't get introduced to your property in the first place, then you're staying ahead of the game. Because because once they get there, then they get established and they're very, very difficult to remove. So there's a few different options uh, depending on what the situation is. Sometimes you can really graze them intensively and you know get them to kind of go away a little bit. Uh, sometimes there are herbicides out there that are specific to different species. Sometimes uh, controlled burning can assist with that. Uh, but really, no matter what, if you have like a serious monoculture that you're trying to remedy, it's going to take a lot of time, energy, and money to get rid of that. One of the tricks, if you will, that I heard when I used to work in western Oklahoma where there was a lot of weeping love grass, uh, one of the strategies was that if I've got a thousand acres and, and 50 acres of it is weeping love grass, I try to get 50 to 80 percent of my grazing off of that improved pasture and then I just use my native range as a lifeboat. And that seemed like a pretty sound strategy because typically, 
at least here in the western portion of Texas, the more we can defer or rest our native pastures, probably the better off we are for quail. So focus that grazing on those grasses like Bermuda grass and that kind of thing. Get most of your grazing there and then just don't hit your natives any harder than you have to. Exactly, yeah, you can kind of shift pressure to those improved grasses and use them for what they were introduced for initially. Um, and then you can maintain other areas as quail habitat. As a prudent manager, if you see areas that have exotics coming into them, they're invading into those, what should you do? Well, you really have to be careful initially because a lot of these exotic species will actually uh, take advantage of like a significant soil disturbance. Uh, like we said, they're really hardy, they're really good at surviving, and they're really good at coming back after something like that. So if you see that you have, you know, just a few patches of exotics and you just completely disturb the whole area, then they can potentially um, push out your native species and take that area over. So you want to be a little bit cautious with that. Uh, just kind of keep an eye on them. And in some cases, if you're able to, you know, maintain your native species, then they can rein in those exotics a little bit. If you have some of those little spot problem, problematic areas, would you ever consider uh, surgical strikes with something like glyphosate, spraying with that? I do think that something like that would probably be the best approach if you just have kind of spotty areas of exotics that you're seeing coming in, as opposed to trying to do something dramatic to a wide region where you have a lot of natives that are still established. One of the quail managers we've met down in South Texas where they do have a lot of issues with exotics, he summarized the situation with, if they're not a monoculture, we can live with them. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree with that. And it kind of goes along with the saying, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Okay. So you can, if you can learn to live with it, then you should do that. Okay. So Bermuda grass is an example of an exotic grass in Texas that has virtually no utility for quail. For one thing, it's what we call a sod forming grass, meaning that it tends to grow in a continuous sheet on the ground, as opposed to a bunch grass, like little blue stem, for example, that grows in clumps. Because it grows in a continuous sheet, it doesn't make those little avenues for movement that you would find in a field full of bunch grass. So it tends to restrict quail as they're trying to actually move throughout the landscape. In addition to that, it really doesn't get tall enough to provide any significant like thermal refuge or concealment from predators. So a quail caught in a Bermuda grass field is for starters going to have a hard time moving around and he's also not going to have any protection from aerial predators that are trying to eat him.